Hello, everybody. My name is Harvey Brownstone. It is my great pleasure to welcome Ella Burakowski, author of Hidden Gold, a book that moved me so much that I felt compelled to reach out to her and ask her if we could do this interview. Thank you, Ella. Welcome. Thank you for agreeing to speak with me. Hi, Harvey. Thank you for asking me. I mean, uh, it's my honor. I uh, want to just very briefly outline the uh, subject of your book. Uh, it deals with your grandparents, your mother and her two siblings, your uncle and aunt, who were in Poland during the war. They were Jewish. They were uh, subjected to deplorable hardship. Uh, your grandfather was murdered by the Nazis as best as we know, and the remainder of the family were hidden through, for 26 months in unspeakably horrific circumstances. That is is that a fair, quick summary? It is a fair, quick summary. They were hidden and uh, that is the absolutely a fair, quick summary. Now, uh, your writing, the book, I take it was a very personal decision. It was, a, it was a very personal decision, but it actually was a, a, an evolution. I didn't wake up one day and say, I have to uh, write this book and get all the, the information down. It's really not how it happened at all. The book was, believe it or not, was actually written by accident. Um, how so? I, I can explain it, that to you, actually. My uncle... Um, was the only remaining survivor who was alive. And he really, really wanted to get his story told. So his children and grandchildren and, and generations to come would have a record of what he lived through. Um, and now, he was 12 years old at the time of these events. He was 12 years old when he was in hiding. Yes. And um, he, he didn't quit click with anybody. Like he tried to find some ghost right and he just didn't click with anybody. And it just, it, it just wasn't happening. Anyways, fast forward to my life. I was working at the Canadian Jewish News and it, we were coming on to another lovely winter in Toronto. And I really didn't want to spend every night after four o'clock when it got pitch black outside sitting on my couch. So I, looked for a continuing education course and I um, looked up for, I, I really wanted Photoshop, it was full. Everything I wanted was full. The only thing that was open was creative writing for some reason. That and was a blessing. <laughs> and because I had a column in the paper, I, I, I was writing an advice column in the, in the paper, I thought, oh, maybe this is not a bad choice. You know, I'll, I'll learn from it because really I never took any other writing courses. The second, the second assignment was to write a dialogue. I thought I'm gonna nail this one. And I thought I have to come up with something very interesting. And I knew about them hiding in the barn. I, I knew that, I didn't know the details, but I knew about it. So I thought, I wonder what they talked about for like two years in that enclosure in that barn. So I made up a dialogue. I just made one up and uh, when it came time to read it to the class, you could hear a pin drop. I mean, people, the people were mesmerized. They, uh, some, uh, you know, they, they weren't Jewish. They didn't really know a whole lot about the Holocaust. They just couldn't believe that somebody went through this. Anyways, after class, the, the instructor asked me if I would continue along the same theme and write everything to do with it. Well, okay, <laughs> for sad to know about it because I really didn't know a whole lot. And so I that ended up- part, That part really amazes me that you lived a fair portion of your life not knowing what your grandparents and your uncle and, uh, your uncle and your um, aunt and your mother went through. I didn't, except for the tapes. My uncle did have um, a tape that he had made with a recording that he had made with McGill University. And he did one with the Shoah Foundation, which I listened to m many years prior. But my mother died when I was 14, long before I ever had an opportunity to hear her stories or was even interested in her stories. 
at, you know, at 14. And I, I, I went to associated uh, a Jewish parochial school and um, I learned about the Holocaust. I mean, that's, we learned about it a lot. And I knew I, as a, growing up as a second generation, people who grow up in, in homes where upbringing, their, their lives are a little different and you don't even realize that growing up because you're in it. But like little examples, like my freezer was always stuffed with bread. Um, like to, there was never enough bread in the house, never ever enough bread. Nobody really ate the bread and uh, everything was a secret. I wasn't allowed to talk about anything. Um, my clothes were all hand-me-downs. I looked like a, an immigrant fresh off the boat. I was- I, You were a I, child I, of, of Holocaust survivors. Yeah, and- But uh, getting back to the book, Right. You Sorry. must have eventually. You you must have eventually sat your uncle down and got all the details. That's what happened. So I ended up writing, you know, a little bit about the book, and then I went over to see him to his house, and I said, "Look, I wrote this little bit of uh, information about," and 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 he really liked it because I wrote it in such a way. I I almost wrote it as a thriller, because. When I was writing, I, I thought the people in the class, they don't know my family. They don't know the characters. And I thought the only way they're gonna know these characters are to make them into real life people that they can identify with, that they can feel their personalities and know, know them. So now, I, what made you decide to write this book as if it were fiction? And just for the benefit of those watching, most Holocaust memoirs that I have read are in the first person. The survivor themselves wrote the book and speak about what they went through from their perspective. But Ella chose to write this book as a story, as she says, as a thriller, as a story um, with dialogue uh, in the third person. Um, what inspired you to do that? It was actually um, very original and highly compelling. Uh, thank you, Harvey. I, I decided to do that because the same as the people in the classroom, I'm thinking, I was not thinking of getting this book published. I was thinking of making a record for generations to have the story, for generations of my family to have the story of how they're even here, wh what their heritage was. And I knew that very soon, they're not gonna know these people that are in the book. And, and most of them, they don't know, they didn't know at that time even, they were mostly all dead by then. Um, and I thought the only way they're going to even have any connection to these people is if I write them, like I write them in a, in a when I read a book. When I read a book, I, you know, I, I love character driven books. It's, it's my thing. I, I love to connect to the characters. I, if I'm reading a good book with good characters, those characters become my friends. They stay with me long after the book is over. Well, and I so can tell you that was very much the feeling I got in reading your book. And um, I take it then that since your aunt and your mother and your grandmother were gone, you had to rely on David to flesh out the personalities of these people. Not of those people. I knew those people. I knew their personalities. What, what I relied on David for was details of what happened to them in the war. The personalities of the, of the players, of the, of the main players, um, not the people that they came in contact with, but the main players, my mother, my aunt, my uncle. I didn't know my grandfather. Right. I never met him. And, and my grandmother lived with us till she ended up at Baycrest when she was like, you know, late in her late eighties or whatever. But she now, that's a good point. You knew you knew these people, and what you really needed him to fill in was the details of what happened, and um, the experience of being in a barn, in a small enclosure in a barn, a hidden compartment of a barn, for twenty six months with no access to the outside world. That's correct, and. No, and, and a lot of the story, that's only one part of the story. A lot of the story is how they even got to that barn. Uh, what happened in their town before um, Hitler invaded. Yes. Um, 
a, a, there's a big lead up to that barn time. And the one thing that I had to do, because this is a nonfiction book, it's called Creative Nonfiction. The actual events that happened in the book are events that happened. The, the feelings, the dialogue, the what they see, what they taste, what they smell, that's all made up. That is all my imagination. That puts the actual real life events in your mind. Like one thing that I learned in that class, she said, um, show, don't tell. So, you know, when she, you know, that was a theme that I tried to keep in the book, show, don't tell. So if, you can't just say someone's scared. You have to say uh, their hands were shaking. They were sweating. Uh, their Adam's apple went up and down their throat. They were breathing hot. You know, that was the show, don't tell part. So I used that theory for the entire book. I have to tell you for a first time author uh, who just took a course, um, you had the gift of a very compelling story, but the way in which you deliver that story is so riveting that I could not put it down. And um, part of it is because there was so much suspense. There were so many twists and turns. It wasn't just a case of Hitler invading some good friends saying, hey, come and hide in my barn and you'll be fine until the war is over. It was nothing like that. Uh, and I, I, I'd like to get in with you. Uh, for those of you who have not read the book, you need to read it. You need to read it right away. And then I think watching this interview again will assist you with a lot of the um, uh, details that I'm going to ask Ella now. Your family were in that barn with another couple, a couple who had tried to trick them, a Jewish couple. We won't uh, divulge how it ended up that they were with this couple, but suffice it to say that these were not nice people. Um, whatever happened to them? Do you know? They never spoke again. They so they went their separate ways together. and that was the end of it. They spent 26 months together um, doing everything together. Um, and they never, when they, when they left that barn, they went their separate ways and never spoke again. Well, those people were incredibly lucky. Considering... I do know they moved to Israel. Oh, they went to Israel. Well, yes. they were very lucky considering that they were part of a scheme to rob and kill your family, they ended up benefiting from your grandmother's uh, financial capacities to pay for this uh, hiding. And then that was the end of it. The next question I want to ask you is the couple that hid your family, the St uh, Stanchik? Yes. They took money in return for hiding and feeding, if you can call it feeding, your family. Um, how do you feel about that? Well, I have mixed feelings about it because I, I don't know if you would consider them uh, righteous as, as, as in righteous among the nations. It's not my place to make that determination. It was the place of my uncle to make that determination, my grandmother. What did they do? Did they nominate them? They did not. Well, I understood that the criteria for being nominated for a righteous, uh, in other words, a non-Jew who assisted in saving lives was that they were not compensated for it. I, I'm not sure. I have to be honest. I, I, I never really looked into it because I, I would never nominate them if, if my uncle and my family didn't, didn't make that move. On the other hand, Every single year with like clockwork, they were sent a package. My uncle would send them. My uncle had a, a sportswear store, a factory here in Toronto called Golden Bay Sportswear, where he made coats for the OPP and all kinds of stuff like that, like coats, manufactured coats and hunting stuff, stuff like that. He would fill up boxes with coats, with money, with medicine, and every single year he sent a care package. 
back to the stone chicks. That was very generous. I suppose he still felt gratitude. Um, your book covers very, very deep and profound issues. The couple that your family were with in that barn were Jews who were betraying and exploiting other Jews in the hopes of saving their own skin. You, you know what, I, I, I try also, it's, it's hard not to judge. It really is hard not, not to judge, but speaking of judge, <laughs> but um, I, I have to, tr I can't, I can't allow myself to go there because I don't know what I would do to save my own life. I'd like to think I wouldn't do that, but I have no idea how I would be in that situation. So they were not the, the nicest people and they, they needed to survive. And this is what they chose to do to survive. How, they, did you, how did you want the reader to envision them? Because I, I found myself disliking them intensely, particularly the husband who seemed to eat more than his share of the food, was mean, spirited, and devious. He was mean-spirited and devious, and there was a lot of stuff that was actually cut from the book because it is a young adult book, and it is meant for, say, for adults as well, but it's, it's appropriate for the, say, 14 and up age group. Um, Second Story Press, the publisher of the book, chose to remove some more questionable Part. They took out a lot of bo bodily functions for starters, and you know he was very abusive. Let's let's just leave it at that. He was a very abusive man. Well, I think you are aware, though, that uh, just the knowledge that uh, he and his wife were Jewish and that they had participated in a scheme to defraud and probably kill your family does raise the issue of Jewish conspirators. Um, and I think it's up to the reader, as you say, to decide how they're going to assess that uh, information and deal with that issue. I can't disagree with you. None of us know what we would have done to try and save our own lives during that period. Now, the couple that hid your family also are not portrayed as particularly nice people. Um, they did it for money. They when did the it for money, but when again, the money stopped I, I coming, yeah. the food was diminished. But the food was not diminished because they were being mean. The food was diminished because they had diminished food. They didn't have oh. a lot of food. I, I got the impression that when the food stopped coming, uh, when the money stopped coming, the soup got thinner. It absolutely got thinner because they didn't have money to buy food. Don't forget that they were a family of five before they had hid six Jews in their barn. They were a family of five in the middle of a war. Money stopped coming in. They didn't have the money to feed their own family, let alone the family in the barn. So they didn't let them starve to death. They still brought them stuff, but in all intents and purposes, they, they were starving. They were starving because but I, I wasn't there. Again, I try not to judge too much because they did keep them alive. They didn't turn them in. And that may have been self-serving because if they had just let them loose into the forest um, and they would have been caught, they may have turned them in. They don't know. It's very interesting to me. This couple had two children, did they not? Three. They had three children that they had to keep this secret from they did and keep the secret for fear that the children what might my uncle tells me right so they they had their own uh, worries because if these children were wander into the barn or watch their father going to um, deliver food um, they might get curious they might say something careless like kids can yes um, that must have been very stressful for them and I I, I, I found myself really struggling with how to assess these people. On the one hand, they don't come across as really generous, uh, but they did something that they could have been killed for. I know, that's, that's really, I, I'm on the fence. It's like I say, it's not my place to make the decision. I wasn't there. 
but they did, they did what they did for money so that they could live a better life through the war. Um, they didn't do it because they felt bad for the Jews that were being killed. They didn't do it for righteous reasons. They did it for, for their own reasons and they needed to survive as much as the people in the barn had to survive. So, so in, in, in addition to sending the care packages, uh, did David ever see them again? Yes, he went back with my sister, with his wife in uh, 1991, I believe, just around the fall of communism before it became popular and for people to go back. And he did actually uh, see them. I actually have uh, some pictures I'd be happy to share with you. Would you be interested in seeing them? Oh yes, please go ahead. Okay, let me just do a quick screen share here. Um, we were just talking about the Strunchik's family back in 1991. Um, so here you go. Uh, the, my uncle is in the center wearing the white with the uh, little backpack on his uh, fanny pack there. Yes. Uh, just to the right of him, is the woman who hit him. There she is. There she is. I don't know how old she is there, but there she's she got to be, she's got to be pretty old. Now, I, the other people there, I, I believe those are the children and mate, and, and I believe that's a, a grandchild there. I see. So, so there was two daughters and a son. So uh, I think the fourth woman, maybe the younger one in between the two there, yes. in between my uncle and that woman in the purple dress, she may be uh, the wife of the son who's standing on the left side. And uh, the other ones are their children. So they were all there and they were all alive. So I guess at some point after the war, they were told that there were, had been six people hiding in the barn. Yeah, so let me just, while I have the screen share going, if you, let me just show you a couple of things here. So here you have the actual barn. And- uh, And you see how close it is to the road, how, exactly. how much in danger they were, because if anyone passing by had heard noise of people talking in that barn, it could have given them away. What's really important of this picture that I studied to death is exactly what you said, Harvey, the, the proximity to the road and how close it is. And people use that road all the time to go back and forth to Gori, which was their, the main town, uh, the closest, also a very tiny town, but a main town. That's where the church was. So on Sundays, they were able to actually stretch their legs because most of the people in Kolko, where this was, had gone to Gori to, to, to church. But the other thing that I studied here very importantly was that, see the forest in the back of the uh, barn? Yes. That really comes into play as well. It sure does. The other thing that makes me shudder when I look at that barn, there's a, a scene in the book where the Nazis come looking for Jews and our, uh, your family came very, very close to being discovered and killed. That's right. So that barn, that barn, if those walls could talk, that barn would have a lot to say. It sure would. And so this is, uh, this is a picture that was taken in 1991 when they went back. You can see that very little upgrades were done to the barn. It's pretty much in the same condition that it was. And although my uncle was sending care packages for, for decades already, even when they went into the, their home, the floor in the kitchen was a dirt floor. They never put in, they never did any, I don't know what they did with the money that they received, um, but they didn't use it to better their lifestyle. They still lived like this. They so lived like that. What did your grandfather say about that visit with, uh, with the wife? of uh, the wife uh, who really never met them at all during the the uh, 26 months she you mean what my uncle said yeah what, sorry yeah what did your uncle david say about about her because it, the you know what was that very she never ever met your family very interestingly my uncle uh was very excited to go back to poland um and he 
he, my sister tells me the story because she went with him that um, one day they were walking down the street and he said, I feel like I'm home. So wow. at that point, the memories of the war had, I guess, diminished and the happiness of his childhood and how he was brought up and the good times he had, not necessarily right here at this particular spot, but they went back to where they, they lived in the, in the park across the street and all that stuff. He, he really, he, he felt very sentimental. As far as how he felt about the people, I don't know if he had much, much, he wanted to see it. I, I'm sure he was nervous, but you know, he wanted to film it. He wanted to make sure it was documented. And I think that was his goal. I find it fascinating that um, he wanted to meet the woman because this is someone who had six people living in her barn for 26 months and never met anyone except your mother, who uh, we're going to get to next, um, who, who went into town twice uh, under very secretive and very dangerous conditions. Right. Uh, there's a chapter in the book where your mother goes into the house and meets the wife. Right. But that, that's part of my creative nonfiction. <laughs> I don't know for sure if that happened. I really don't know for sure if that happened. So just for um, the, the fans of your book, uh, that's a bit of a disappointment to know that the chapter where your mother goes into the house to get cleaned up and get some makeup on to try and make herself look less like um, uh, a Jew in hiding, uh, that actually didn't happen. The wife wasn't that generous. Yeah, just to put it in perspective, she did have to go back into town. She had to find more money. They had run out of money. She had to find more money. And she knew where there was going to be some money, but how was she gonna get there? Remember, my uncle was 12 years old. So, and they didn't tell him everything because as a 12 year old child, you don't say, tell your kid everything. You protect your kid as much as you can. So when I asked him, how, how did mommy get there? How did she get there? So he looked at me, says, what do you mean, how did she get there? She just went. So as, an, as a writer and, and somebody who wants to keep you interested in the book, I have to make it believable and plausible. I have to make the story work. I can't skip over how this woman who's been in hiding for you know, half the time for over a year makes it into town without getting caught, completely disheveled, completely weak. How am I gonna get her there? So I did know, I did actually know about that pathway in the forest, that was true. There was that pathway in the forest. And once I used Google Maps and I saw that that forest led from the barn right to Pinchoff, I thought it's the only way she could have gone. She couldn't have gone on the road. No. She couldn't have gone in a car. She couldn't have gone on a horse. She had to have gone through the forest. She had to have. Now, are there any other pictures you want to show us before we leave screen share? Yes, I'm going to just do that. So this picture was taken um, actually in 1996, I believe. So now you can see, you see that little wall there? There's a little wall on, in, in the center that's about four feet high. Yes. That's, it was under there that they were hidden. It's oh. open now, but that was the height. So six people were in there. For 26 and, months. Yeah, and, and the slats on that little wall, they, they took out two slats and that was camouflaging the underside and on top was all straw. So although this is not a great shot, you can see um, that wall, you can see how the uh, grain is piled on top and you can see the slat that was removed for them to go inside to hide. And this, uh, just, I'll just give you this last picture. This picture is a picture that was taken, I believe in 2016, when, my, my, when Dave's son went back, his son Ari, his eldest son. Um, so that's how close the house is to the barn. And that's the chicken coop in the back where they would empty their bucket full of feces and urine every night um, in the back there. And again, you see the forest that runs right through. This really helps bring 
the incredible ordeal to life. So now we're back where we can uh, see each other. Your mother, your mother is portrayed as the most courageous of the bunch. You mentioned one time that she had to make her way back to town in the hopes of finding money that your father had buried. She gets all the way there only to find that somebody else has taken it. Maybe your father, maybe somebody else, but she comes back empty handed. And then they realize there's no money left to pay this rent. And then a second time she goes into town because your grandmother was sure they were all gonna die. She sends your daughter into town to go and see the pharmacist to buy cyanide pills. And the cyanist, the, 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 uh, you'll have to read the book to find out why the cyanide pills were not taken. But your mother, uh, it's heartbreaking to find that she died in her early 50s, I believe. 52. And without telling you any of this. Right. Did so, she seem to you to be the kind of mother that was that courageous that would, would go out? She had not had a shower in a year. She was so skeletally thin. It was questionable whether she could walk 10 kilometers there and 10 back. What kind of person was she? You know, I, I, I didn't really know my mother much more than her just being a mom. She was my mom. She was a very, uh, she was, she did, she was the kind of person that did what had to be done. Um, she worked two jobs when we came back, when we came to Canada, she did what had to be done. Um, she really was the one that wore the pants in the family. Uh, she's so the she one was who, strong. She was, she was strong, but she was weak too. The Holocaust and then moving to Israel where I was born actually um, really wore her down because once she felt she moved heaven and earth to move to Israel. Uh, she went there on the, uh, she met my father in a displaced persons camp called Fehrenwald in Germany. And they uh, went on one of the uh, Aliyah Bet ships to Israel. First, they were turned away by the British. They were interned in, in Cyprus. Eventually they did make it to Israel. That was the dream of my grandfather to live in Israel. And, but of course, it, it was not a safe place. Um, there was a lot of fighting between the Arabs and the Jews, and she couldn't handle any more fighting. She just couldn't handle any more. That's when she moved to Canada to be with my uncle. And, uh, and we lived together under the same roof. My uncle's family and my family, we lived together. We grew up together under the same roof. Your, your mother must be wherever she is smiling down on you that you've immortalized her you brought these characters to life to such a degree that i'm telling you uh, when a person finishes reading your book there's a feeling that you really know them and then you find out the heartbreaking reality that your mother and I'm your aunt, that the, your, your mother and your aunt both did not live long lives they did not live long lives. And you, you know, Harvey, I, I, you know, as a, as a, as a kid and, and as a young teen, I, you know, I, I didn't know them that well. I, I was very involved in my own life. Right. right like, right. and I wasn't all that interested in their life. So it wasn't until I wrote hidden gold that I actually got to know who my mother was. I, I was actually able to walk in her shoes through the darkest time in her life. And I actually got to know her by writing this book. I actually got to feel her and feel her fear and feel her courage and, and feel her wisdom. And, and I was the one. So as I wrote, I wrote the book from 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. every morning before I went to work. And as I wrote every single morning, I felt like someone was guiding my hand. I... Remember, I'm not, I, I'd never, it's not something I was planning to do. It just poured out of me. It poured out of me. Well, it really feels that way when you read it. Um, another heartbreaking aspect for the reader is to find that there were no reparations payments made. Your, your, your grandparents, from what I can tell in the book, were upper middle class, highly successful, 
They lived a very good life in Poland before the war. Your grandfather was well-respected, well-known in the community. He was a councilman. He was a town councilman. He had a successful business. They had a beautiful home. Um, this home was taken. The business was taken. No reparations. No. That is a shock. Well, well you know, they, they did, my uncle did get, uh, you know, compensation from the German government like so many other Jews did. My mother did not. Um, I'm not exactly sure why she did not. There was some kind of issue with her application. I don't remember what it was. But my grandmother and my uncle, and I believe my aunt, all got uh, some kind of monthly compensation that came from the German government. But the property... No, the property is lost. The property was promised to to the Stanchiks as in lieu of extra money. And my uncle had every intentions of making good on that promise. And uh, where that property is today, there's a Polish bank sitting there. And uh, they never got the deed to the house. He tried, he, he hired lawyers in Poland, lawyers here, he tried, he really tried. He did not want that house in the hands of the Poles. But no, despite all those efforts, and despite the obvious proof that that house was taken from them, uh, the, nobody's ever compensated the family for the value of that house. That's a heartbreak as well. No, and, and I don't think it's an unusual story. I don't think many people understand that, that although there may have been reparations payments made by the German government and not to everyone, it doesn't compensate for property that was taken. No, and, and many people tried to get their houses back. Um, there are a handful of people that managed, but most people could not. I wanna to talk to you now, Ella, about uh, the reception to the book. It, was, it, it, it has been awarded at least one prize? Yes, it was, um, it was uh, nominated from the Ontario Library Association for the Forest of Reading uh, nonfiction Red Maple, they call it. They have, it's a, it's a thing that they do in schools. So all the kids across Ontario read all kinds of books, all sets of books. So approximately a quarter of a million kids read the books in this category and then they vote. And um, Hidden Gold came in second, it won the honor book. Uh, the book that won that year was a, a, a child soldier, I think from the Congo. He wrote well, his story. Congratulations on that. Thank I you. see the book as uh, having a much broader readership than uh, students. Um, and I question the publisher's decision to focus the book on a young, a, a, a youthful audience, when to me, this is a book that really um, exemplifies the human condition on so many levels. Any chance of the book becoming a movie? <laughs> Can you make it a movie? I've heard that so many times. So many people have told me this book needs to be a movie. It needs to be a movie, I guess, because of all the action in it. And, and uh, I think it would make a fabulous movie, but yeah. I have... The, again, the publisher has the rights. I don't know if they've ever moved on it. It has just now, within the last few weeks, been made into an audio version uh, that's available on Audible or Amazon. And it was narrated by Teresa Tova, who is an award-winning actress. She did an incredible job of narrating the book. Uh, she brings the characters to life way more than what, just, what you just said from reading it. So it's kind of an in-between a movie and a read. Um, well, it's just a question of time, Ella. I think that if the right production people get their hands on the book and read it, it cries out to be made into a movie. Um, it's just so suspenseful. It's so, uh, it's so authentic in the emotions that occur. It's it's a, a, in a way a small capsule into the whole Holocaust, the, occupied, the occupation of Poland, the victimization of Jews before they went into hiding, what happened to them in hiding. 
And um, the reality is that most Holocaust memoirs deal with the camps. There's yes. not a lot written by people who were hidden. I'll tell you something. When I went back to, um, I did some research in the uh, uh, United States Holocaust Museum in Washington. And when I went through there, I, I guess I'm one of the only people that was disappointed because it was all camps. It was all about the camps. There was such a small, small area there of people that were actually uh, talked about that were hidden. And I have to tell you, if it wasn't for Anne Frank, I'm not sure that the people that were hidden or even the partisans in the forest would get um, enough recognition. And it's a really important part of how people survived. Nobody survived without help and nobody survived without luck. You needed both those things to survive. I I've never heard a story of any anybody who didn't have those two things on their side. Now your uncle David, who was the youngest person in that barn, got to live long enough to see this book. He did, he, he wanted it so badly and it meant so much to him. He, um, he did see the book published. He did know that it got nominated. He died before it won. Um, and he walked around everywhere with that book. He would walk around United Bakers here, uh, 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 a very popular um, dairy restaurant here in Toronto. He walked around table to table. Look in my book. Look at my book. <laughs> he would, you know, he he was so proud of it. He really was very, very proud that his story was finally on paper, that it would live past him, and it has done that. It certainly has, and it will live past you and me. And I'm hoping it will. Your grandmother did live a long life. She did. She lived into almost, I think, 90. Did she ever talk about the period uh, of time that they were hidden? Never. And no one ever found out what really happened to her husband, your grandfather? No. And my uncle was a member of many, many um, Holocaust groups. He was a member of the Hidden Children's Group in New York. He, uh, they, they tried very hard uh, through the International Tracing Service. I even tried when I wrote the book. I tried to find what happened to him. Um, there is no record because in Treblinka, most of the records were destroyed. So we have to assume, in Auschwitz, they kept very good records and they were, and there's a lot of record. The Germans were, were there was a whole 60 minutes done on, on the miles and miles of filing cabinets uh, below ground of all the uh, documentations that the German ha Germans had. But in Treblinka, everything was destroyed. So the people that were murdered in Treblinka, they were, they were basically assumed to have been murdered because there is not a lot of documentation. And there's no documentation or very little about the people that were just marched in the, into the forests and, and murdered en masse. Exactly. There is, no, there is no documentation for those people. We will never know what happened to your grandfather and it's clear that your grandmother never wanted to talk about it. She didn't. And my grandmother, like as you, as you read in the book about her premonitions, she continued to have premonitions. And, and I guess I'm a, I don't have premonitions, but she made me very superstitious. <laughs> but she had continued to have premonitions because when my when my uh, aunt, my aunt Esther died, the one who lived in the States, the day she died after my mother died and my grandmother was already uh, living on her own in a, in a Baycrest, a Jewish old folks home. The day my aunt died, my grandmother never asked about her again. She knew. She didn't, nobody told her. She just never asked just about her knew. again. There's a very important part of the book when your grandmother has a dream that ends up changing the course of their plan That's to correct. try to survive the war. And uh, again, it's, it's uh, I won't spoil it. I want people to read it for themselves, but I think your grandmother had some kind of a gift. She did. And yet, um, so maybe she knew you were gonna write a book. Maybe she did. <laughs> 
it's possible. I don't know. She was very, she was pretty quiet. I, I don't be, remember, uh, even though she lived in my home, I don't have a, a, a good handle on, on her. She was not touchy feely. She was not warm. She was very uh, regimented, I guess. And I don't know. I think she probably compartmentalized a lot of her life and, and that makes you sometimes robotic. I, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure you're right. In some ways. Um, and I tried to write her that way, very stoic, very, um, you know, strong, but she did break down at times. It, it was interesting, you know, when she would break down, she would, when she would say certain prayers on the high holidays, she just, just bawled. She just turned to mush. The only thing she had from her husband was a kiddish cup. Yes. Who has it now? My, uh, my cousin Ari. David's son. David's oldest son. David's oldest son. Now I want to spend a little bit of time with you about Holocaust education. Okay. Your, your book forms a very important part of literature out there uh, that documents what happened to real people less than a hundred years ago. Um, do you think there's enough Holocaust education in the uh, in uh, secondary schools? I don't think there's enough Holocaust education anywhere. I think that uh, it's really, really important to continue this um, narrative because you can see what's going on in the world around us today. Um, and with the rise of anti-Semitism, and with racism and hate and intolerance being part of our daily news, uh, the words never again and never forget are more important now than they ever have been before. And you've been a part of the ongoing education efforts. You speak at schools. I do, I speak at schools, I speak in libraries. I spoke on Holocaust Education Week a few times. I actually had my book launch in, in, uh, in the middle of Holocaust Education Week. I do whatever I can do. I'm doing your interview. I did an interview on uh, CTV for the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. I do whatever I can do to try and keep this horrific period of history alive. You That's have a website for the book, correct? Yes, it's called hiddengoldbook.com. And on that website, I assume you'll be posting this interview, but you can also find the CTV interview. Yes, there's and, links to everything. And any, any other information about the book and what's happening, any events planned, it's all there on that website. Yeah. You also have a Facebook page, correct, for the book? Yes, yes, there's a Hidden Gold Facebook page as well. Hidden Gold Book, it's called Hidden Gold Book as well. I would be remiss if I did not ask you, Ella, any other books planned, maybe? There's some something in the works. I, I'm not ready to talk about it yet, but it's still in the uh, planning stages. I just actually um, uh, finished working. Um, the Canadian Jewish News uh, folded uh, just when COVID started. We could no longer sustain a printed newspaper. It is coming back now digitally, and uh, they're doing their best to keep uh, the uh, uh, some kind of connection to the community, Jewish connection to the community. But um, I, I'm working on stuff, you know, and and so it's, this is all very new to me. This not having a job, and uh, I, I worked there for a long time, so I, I needed to just. See, see where the dust lies, basically, you know, let everything fall where it may. COVID changed everything for, it, for everybody. Do you have a sense, have you really absorbed how good a writer you are? No, I don't even call myself a writer. <laughs> well, I beg to differ. <laughs> Thank uh, you very I, much. I, I think that anyone reading that book will tell you that you must have received uh, uh, feedback from many people. I've received a lot of very excellent feedback. I have. There's, there's no question. But you know, I don't know. When I when I first wrote this book, I did not expect it to get published. I really didn't. I 
I wrote it for my family. I went and I printed 20 copies just to give out to my immediate family. And that was going to be the end of it. But as people started to read it, they, you know, they said, you, you have to publish this book. You have to publish this book. And then, you know, again, uh, divine intervention took over and I sent it to one publisher and it got published. Uh, Margie Wolf, the publisher of Second Story Press, she said, this is a story worth telling. And she published the book. What do you think? I, 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 I know that your purpose in writing the book had to do with documenting your family history for future generations. But what do you think the value of the book is for the general public? If someone were to ask you, why should I read your book? What would you answer? You know what, in the, in the words of Elie Wiesel, he said, I knew the story had to be told not to transmit an experience is to betray it. That is a quote directly from him. Every single story of survival from the Holocaust is a treasure. It's a moment in time that you'll never get, that we will never get back, that our eyewitnesses, the people who were there are dwindling, they're, they're, they're going. And the people, uh, the kids nowadays and, and adults nowadays will be very lucky if they can ever meet a Holocaust survivor. I know that they're working on a hologram project right now where you can actually talk to a survivor long after they're gone and it's supposed to uh, be interactive, but it's not. When, I, when my uncle was alive, I was very fortunate to be able to take him with me to, uh, School. So Absolutely. Oh, I have wow. I have videos, I have pictures, I have all kinds of things of how after my presentations, they surrounded him like he was Freddie Mercury. I mean, they surrounded him like like he was a rock star. Honest to God, they couldn't get enough of him. They couldn't get enough of him. I understand that very uh, at a very deep level. I think if someone were to ask me, why would I want to read this book? I found that it was very instructive on what human beings are capable of. First of all, the evil, the cruelty, but there was generosity in that book too. There and was generosity and love and, and the love of family. And in the end, how the love actually outweighed the, the evil, how the, you know, it was through the love that they were able to survive as a family. That we, I consider our family very unique and very lucky. Look how many people uh, survived out of our family. It was, it was, it's unusual. It's unusual to have a family like that. The book affirms the, the, the power of survival, the strength of the human spirit, the ability to endure unspeakably uh, monstrous conditions and still come out at the other end a full human being capable of love going on to have relationships have children uh, the ability to uh, forgive the reconciliation that happened when your 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 uncle went back there and and at least met uh, the wife um, there's there is the whole range of um, the human condition in that one book, I think. And yeah. it's, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, Ella. I wish you the very best of success with this book. Thank I you, hope Martin. that people watching this interview will read it. It is life altering. Thank uh, you. It definitely uh, touched me deeply in the heart. I hope a movie is made of it. And I can't wait for your next book. I think you've got at least one more book in you. Thank and I, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time to speak with me, Ella. And I really appreciate that you reached out to me. It really means so much to me. Thank you so, so much. You're very welcome. Again, uh, my name's Harvey Brownstone. It was my pleasure to interview Ella Burakowski, author of Hidden Gold, a very important book that chronicles the journey of one family um, who survived the Holocaust. Thank you, everybody, for watching.